Eric, it's great to be with you this morning. My name's Andrew. I'm um, one of the pastors here at St. Paul's. Uh, in, in particular, I oversee worship and prayer and um, a few other things. Not a lot, really. I try and avoid work as much as possible. That's, um, that's not true. I'm a very hard worker and <laughs> due my salary. Um, we are um, starting a new series today called Alive. And it's, it's over this, this season as we uh, head towards Pentecost and we celebrate the resurrected Jesus Christ. He is risen. risen indeed. Thank you. There's, there's, there's some people alive in the house today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's right. So the cross is empty. Jesus is risen. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty. Jesus is is alive. We are, I don't know about you, but I think as, as people, we, we kind of get fascinated by dead, death to life stories, you know, back from the dead kind of stories. Um, if you remember a few years ago, the Chilean miners who came up through that capsule, the Phoenix, I can't remember how many there were, there were over 30. Um, just 33, is that right? Thank you. 33 uh, miners came up left for dead, but after um, 60-something days, I'm really bad on the details here, um, (laughs) came back to life. Um, This nation has been gripped by the story of Fabrice Mwamba, who was dead for 78 minutes after passing out on a football field. And many, many people were praying that he would um, make a, a recovery, and amazingly he did. And I don't know if you saw this week, we've got a photo of a couple, uh, a couple in Argentina who um, gave birth to um, their little girl who was born um, premature, three months pr- uh, premature. And the doctors, 20 minutes after she was born, pronounced her dead. I don't know if we've got the photo there, Caleb, um, of, this, of these, this couple. 20, minute, 20 minutes later, this, this child was dead. Twelve hours later, she went to the coffin to say her last goodbyes to her daughter. And she thought she saw some movement. And in fact, the baby was not dead, but it was alive. And uh, so this, this media story has been going around the whole, wow, this, this baby that, which was given up for dead was actually alive. There is something about it we, 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 find, we find it amazing. But really, I mean, if we, if we look at it, we look at all these scenarios, they're not really death-to-life experiences, are they? You know, science can explain why people, uh, you know, why it happens, the way it happens. But people don't really die and come back to life. It's just the whole idea of what it means to die and then come back to life, this whole resurrection thing. And I want to ask a question for you this morning. Are you alive do you feel alive? Or have you dragged yourself into church and go, oh my goodness, I have, to, I have to rock up to church again? Or I'm just really feeling really flat right now. I'm, I feel dead. I don't mean, are you alive or dead in the actually living, breathing, heart beating? Because if you were dead, you wouldn't be here. Or it would be really weird. <laughs> I know you're all alive, but are you really alive? Do you feel alive? More, more importantly, do you feel alive when it comes to your relationship with God? Do you wake up excited each morning knowing that you get to journey with your Saviour? Knowing that He is at work in you? Do you wake up wanting to pray? Do you wake up wanting to read Scripture, hungry for more of what He has for you because He has an amazing purpose and plan for you? Or do you wake up with dread and fear and see the Bible and see your faith as something which, as we just heard, was something that you go through the motions with, it's something that you ought to do, it's just another list on your task list? I think God wants to breathe life in us afresh this morning to ignite our imagination again about what it means to be alive 
And I think as we come to this passage this morning, we see that Paul sees the resurrection as a real key to our spiritual life. In fact, it's not just any key, it is the key and it is vital. It is important. Verses 12 and 13. Now, I want you to hold on to your Bibles because we're going to be doing a proper Bible study today. We're going to be going through the Bible um, in less than 30 minutes. Well, not through the whole Bible, just this passage. That would be quick. Um, But verses 12 and 13, Paul says, But someone um, will... No, wrong part. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. He's yelling out and saying, guys, what you believe matters. What you believe about the resurrection matters. He's wanting to get their attention because he's seeing that there's a problem in the Corinthian church. In fact, there's lots of problems with the Corinthian church. But this, I think, is a really key one. And this is where he's coming to the end of his letter. And I think that he, well, he spends a lot of time on the whole idea of the resurrection, the truth of the resurrection. Why? Because it is key to their vibrancy, spirituality, and life within the church. And he's yelling out, this matters. Now, there's a controversy going on, or there's this idea going on, and it's not an unusual idea in the Corinthian church that that people don't get resurrected from the dead. And that might sound a bit strange for someone who's a Christian, but in that context, it may not have been the case. Uh, Referring to N.T. Wright, who's um, written a book on the resurrection of the Son of God, which is an excellent book on this whole subject. If you like footnotes and really, really long books, then go buy it. He makes this point. Ancient paganism, starting with Homer. This is Homer speaking now, going back. Insofar as the ancient non-Jewish world had a Bible, its Old Testament was Homer. And insofar as Homer had anything to say about resurrection, he is quite blunt, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Resurrection is a myth. It doesn't happen. Let's just track a little bit further. So let's go now into Greek thinking. Plato, the philosopher Plato, says this, the soul is the non-material aspect of a human being and is the aspect that really matters. Bodily life is full of delusion and danger. The material body, this, this, this thing that we live in, it's dangerous. The soul, however, is to be cultivated in the present both for its own sake and because its future happiness will depend on such cultivation. So what Plato's saying is don't worry about the body. What you need to do is you need to cultivate the soul because there's a distinction between body and soul. The soul, being immortal, existed before the body and will continue after the body is gone. So what Plato is saying is that the soul is eternal, but the flesh, our, our bodies, are not. There is no resurrection of the body. It's just the soul which lasts. That is what was going on in their thinking. And so when they're saying there is no resurrection, Paul shouts back and says, if you don't believe in a resurrected body, if you don't believe that the material body will be resurrected, resurrected, then you don't believe, as Christians, you do not believe that Jesus Christ was resurrected. That was the issue. In a sense, they were saying that we don't believe that that there is a a bodily, Jesus Christ was bodily uh, raised from the dead. Now we might, as Christians, say, wow, that's pretty wacky, you know, that's crazy. But actually, is it? What about our own context? What about the world that we live in? I don't know if you saw the, um, the research done by the Richard Dawkins Institute for Reason and Science, where they... Um, Uh, conducted a a, a questionnaire to both Christians and non-Christians, but really um, what they're wanting to do is nail down what Christians really believe. And so this is the answer that was given to Christians, those who said that they were Christian, to the question, which of the following best describes your belief about the resurrection? Only 32% of those uh, claiming to be Christian believed that Jesus physically came back from the dead. 32%. Most, most, Christian, most of those who claim to be Christian either say that it's a myth, that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, or that he was raised back spiritually. He was a, a ghost. 
But we know he wasn't a ghost. We know that when we read in Scripture, we see that Jesus physically appeared to his disciples and was touched by Thomas, was touched by Mary. He physically ate fish. Ghosts don't eat fish, as far as I know. I've never had fish and chips with a ghost. Jesus was physically resurrected, yet only 30% of people believe that Jesus physically returned from the dead. That's the culture, that's the Christian culture that we live in here in the UK. And so it matters, it's important what we believe, and we're going to look at that. Firstly, we're going to do this in two parts, we're going to do it really quickly. So see this like a game, you know, of two halves, if you're a sports person, which I am, I like sport, so this is a game of two halves. If you're into drama, then it's two acts, two scenes, whatever. Part one, act one, scene one. Paul begins with negative statements. So verses 12 to 19, this is the first half. And he sets up the scene which is pretty negative. This is pretty negative. So he says, if the resurrection is not real, if Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead, then firstly, the gospel is powerless. So all the claims of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the resurrection, all those claims of Jesus are, are, are powerless. They have no power because he did not come good on his statements. I walked in this morning uh, at, um, well, I can't remember what time it was, but to see Jonathan, uh, the drummer, underneath the sound desk. And, he was, and I, I automatically thought, oh, oh no, here we go again. Because if you're at the carol service, halfway through the carol service, we lost all power. It was, it was not fun for me. Um, and again, we had lost power. See, we, we've got amazing speakers. We've got awesome instruments. Well, you know, maybe awesome is a bit strong, but they're good. Um, that's, you know, I think we need to upgrade. That's just kind of my plea to find... No, no. <laughs> We've got amazing structures, great sound desks, computers. We've got all the works. Wonderful, wonderful. But if we don't have power, they're useless. And this morning when I walked in the door, the fuse had gone. There was no power. The band couldn't rehearse. All this good stuff was useless because there was no power to it. If Jesus isn't alive, there is no power. If Jesus isn't alive and real today, there is no power. We can have all the structures in the world, all the great talk. We can have the Bible. But if Jesus isn't alive, there isn't any power. The gospel is powerless. Paul says, if Jesus is not risen from the dead. Secondly, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, then we are propagating a lie. Do you remember a guy called Harold Camping? Does that ring a bell? don't really hear too much about him now because this old chap from America um, came out about a year ago saying that the end of the world is nigh because on March the 21st, 2011, Jesus is coming back. You remember him? Yeah. People were spending millions on advertising campaigns for this stuff. They're saying, you have got to get ready. Jesus is coming 21st of May. It's going to happen. Well, sure enough, May 21st came and went. And Jesus, as far as I know, <laughs> didn't return. I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> I'm very sure of that. I don't know what happened to those people who spent millions of dollars in advertising campaigns. I, I really haven't heard from Harold Camping since. But that, I'd imagine, is what it would feel like if I was one of those people putting time, money, selling everything, house, everything, and then the next day, you know what? This is a farce. This is a lie. I've been propagating a lie. That is what Paul is saying we are doing if the resurrection is not true. 
Thirdly, we are captured into sin. Sin has not been conquered. The cross, whilst amazing and good, fundamentally does not do everything it sets out to achieve. I want to say here too that there is a danger that we focus too much on the cross at times as Christians. And I'm and not discounting the cross at all. It is power, it's power uh, for, for salvation and for the forgiveness of sins. But I find myself often saying the gospel a little bit like this. You know, Jesus died in my place for my sins. That's the gospel. But that's not all the gospel. Because Jesus just didn't die for my sins so that I can be forgiven. He also rose again. It's only half the story. And I think that sometimes we only live in half the story. Are we alive? Or are we living in only half the story? Jesus has forgiven me, now it's up to me to do the rest. Fourthly, we're headed for death. In verses 18 and 19. Then those also have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. By fallen asleep, Paul means those in faith who have died. If only, for the, uh, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are pitied more than all the others. So we are headed for death. We follow Jesus to the grave. We are not resurrected. There is no life. We have no hope. He goes on to say, we're headed for death. We have no hope. And then sixthly, we are pitied as losers. We are losers. We're on the wrong team. And I hate losing. I don't like being on the wrong team. That is the first half story. Let's have a first half break. Because the analysis at the moment isn't really good. Let's be honest, we're down 20 goals and we don't know where to go from here. Paul has definitely set out a terrible scene. If Jesus hasn't died, then we are shot. And you may have questions. I don't know where you're at right now in terms of what you think about Jesus and the resurrection and whether you actually believe it's true or not or whether this whole Christianity thing is, is really worth pursuing. Well, can I point you to a few things? Firstly, there might be some good books that you can read. After this series, we're going to be studying the, uh, going through The Reason for God. There's a book written by Tim Keller called The Reason for God. He addresses these questions. Perhaps you want to pick that up. If you want to go a little bit further, then there's a book by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ, where he, a journalist from the Chicago Tribune, goes and asks some of the deep questions about the Christian faith. Let me encourage you to buy that book and read it as, as theologians write into him and say, this is what we think. This guy was not a Christian when he was doing his, his research. Or maybe you want to uh, look even deeper at something like N.T. Wright's book on the resurrection and the Son of God. Secondly, We've got, a, uh, we've got an Ocker team here this week, it's, um, guys from Oxford who are ready and willing to answer all your difficult questions about the resurrection. So think of, think of them now and then go and pin one of them down afterwards. Is that a bit cruel? Maybe just a touch. Fine, come and ask me. Um, and then thirdly, we've got a Reason for God series coming up. I mentioned the book just before, wrestling with some of these questions. I invite you to come along. And just begin to explore, is Jesus really who he says he is? I'm not going to go into all the apologetics of it now and defend why I believe Jesus is truly resurrected. But there is one thing I want to say, one story, which I think is most compelling for me. In Luke 24, there is a story of a guy called Cleo, Cleopas, I like to call him Cleo, and his friend, which I like to call Theo. We don't know his name, but I just think it was Theo. Cleo and Theo were disciples. And they had pinned their hope on this Jesus as their Messiah. And it hadn't happened. Jesus was dead. And they're walking from Jerusalem back home to Emmaus. Seven mile walk. Don't know how long that takes. I don't know if Rich is in the building, but he's running lots of miles at the moment. Seven miles, that's a long way. That would get you to, would that get you to West London well and truly? A long way. It's a long walk. 
and they are living in the second half, in the first half. They've just had the first half, and they are in this place that Paul has described as no hope. There is no hope after death. We are losers. Jesus was a lie. He was fake. The, the power of the gospel is not real. That is where they were at. It was a long seven-mile walk home. But as they were walking, they were joined by this international man of mystery. Someone that they didn't know, but who seemed to know a lot. I would have loved to have been in that conversation. As Jesus, this, this mystery man, Jesus, came alongside them and began to teach them from Moses and the prophets right through why everything had to take place. I mean, that would have been the most awesome Bible study ever, I reckon. And their hearts began to rise. Oh, really? And then as they brought this mystery man, Jesus, into their home, as he broke bread, their eyes were opened. And here's the thing for me, which I think is really profound in terms of why I believe the resurrection is real, is why in the world, if the resurrection didn't happen, do we have a church? Why are we here now 2,000 years later? Because what we see with Cleo and Theo is when their eyes were opened, their life completely changed. They ran that seven miles back. Their hearts rejoicing. We see as Jesus reveals himself to people, lives are ignited, people become alive again. They believe it. So much to the point that 11 of the 12 disciples were martyred. Now, why in the world would you be martyred for somebody who's not real, who's dead, who has lied, who is false? You wouldn't. See, for me, I think that one of the most profound arguments for the resurrection is that people changed so dramatically that they died for the cause. And so we look then, as Paul switches now, we go into the second half. Paul has presented a, a dire case if Jesus isn't resurrected. But there's a big, but what is the re resurrection then? If the resurrection matters as it does, as he said, then what is it about? And he answers pretty much back from those six points I made earlier. I want to reply, as Paul does, with, with six responses. Firstly, he says that the, the gospel has power. Verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep, those who are dead. To refer to, to Tom Wright again, N.T. Wright, he writes, For Paul, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is the heart of the gospel. It is the object of faith, the ground of justification, the basis for obedient Christian living, the motivation for unity, and not least, the challenge to principalities and to powers. The gospel has power. It has power to raise death to life. It has power to transform and to change. And so we should not ignore the resurrection when we think about the gospel. Because it is in the resurrection that we are enabled to live out the gospel. The truth of the reality that Jesus has died for us so that we can be forgiven, that we can be made free, that we can be made whole, that we can be made alive. Secondly, we are proclaiming truth. We are being called to proclaim truth. We are what we say. We see a little bit earlier in the chapter that, that Paul is saying, I have been proclaiming the gospel. So we're not proclaiming a lie, we're proclaiming the truth. And that's the invitation for us to do, is to proclaim in power the truth of the gospel. Thirdly, we are free and forgiven. Verse 21 for since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a human being. Let me keep reading. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. We are free and forgiven. We are not captured, captured to sin. We are not slaves to sin. We are not bound by idols. You see, if Jesus isn't alive, then all we are engaging, is, is, all we are engaging in is 
pure religion. Just another idol. Jesus died, but you know, it's a, he's a really good idea. He might, might have been a myth, or actually he didn't really rise from the dead, but he was a really great bloke, you know, a really great guy, had some really good things to say. So I, I think I'm going to dedicate my life to that. That's just, Jesus is dead. That's, that, would be, that would be like religion, pursuing another idol, like a piece of stone or wood or something sitting in the corner of the car in your garage or your career. The truth of the resurrection says that we have something that's far greater than that. We are free because we are made new through Christ. Fourthly, and I've already mentioned this, those in Christ are being made alive. We are not dead, but we are being made alive. That is why we're calling this series Alive. And we're going to explore this over the next four or five weeks a lot more, what it means to come alive, what it means to live out the resurrection life. I look forward to it because it is exciting. Basically, what Paul is saying here is that we are dead in Adam, that we are all in sin, we are all destined for death. But in Christ, the second Adam, he has accomplished what the first Adam couldn't and offers us life. And so we have hope. It was interesting that the 1 Peter um, passage was was noted today that um, we are to be equipped, we need to be ready to give a reason for what? For our hope. Give a reason for our hope. What is the reason for our hope? It's the resurrection. Jesus is alive. And finally, the awesome news that Jesus has won. Jesus is victorious. Jesus wins. Love wins because Jesus wins. I don't know what your view is of victory. I don't know what your view is of Jesus. But Jesus has won. He has defeated the cross once. He has defeated death. And he will return one day. There's a well-known comment. I'll read it from a guy called Mark Driscoll. Um, And this just to challenge us, because I think sometimes we get totally lost in our culture with our Christian faith. We're we're the marginalised, we're the few, we we don't really have a say. In fact, we we, we don't have, it's really interesting, I love Dawkins, Dawkins Institute for Reason and Science, as if anybody who, you know, we're definitely unreasonable. We just throw our brains out the door when we walk into church. Not. We can get this kind of thinking like actually what I think and what I believe actually isn't, actually really isn't very clever and we we in culture where, you know, the media said this or whatever and we begin to believe the fact that actually are we really victorious? Are we living in a, a victorious life? Is Jesus really alive and at work? Is he doing things? What's our vision of Jesus Christ? Because he is returning again as king one day. As Driscoll says, some people want to recast Jesus as a limp wrist hippie in a dress with lots of product in his hair who drank decaf and made pithy Zen statements about life while shopping for the perfect pair of shoes. In Revelation, Jesus is a prize fighter with a tattoo down his leg, a sword in his hand, and the commitment to make someone bleed. That is a guy I can worship. And that is true. So Jesus is, is, is not safe. Jesus is victorious. Jesus is powerful. Jesus is king. That is the God that we worship. That is the God that we bow down to. That is the God that we stand in these pews and we sing songs. It's not kind of like some kind of therapy session. When we worship, we are worshipping the King who is risen, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. That is who we worship, and that is the King that is resurrected from the dead. That is power. That is life. That is Christianity, and that is what we believe. And if you don't, that's what you should believe. Jesus is risen from the dead. 
There's a lot more that I'd love to say about the resurrection, um, but I know we don't have time. So I just want to say this one final thing as I come into land. Is that for resurrection to take place, death must occur. There must be death. And if we're invited into a resurrection life, if we're invited to be alive, excited, excited about life, excited about what God is doing in us because he is alive and at work through the Holy Spirit which he promised because he has risen from the dead. If that is the invitation to live the resurrection life, we must first die. We must die. And that is a daily death. Where we come before the King, the one who is Lord, the one who is risen again and who is returning, and say, have all of me. Use me. Fill me. I want to be alive. And I don't know where your life is at. I don't know whether, as I said before, you are kind of living out half the gospel. You believe that Jesus has forgiven you, but you don't know how then to live out that. You're striving and you're trying. Yeah, I kind of know that Jesus died for me. I remember those stories from way back, and they keep saying it here at church, that I'm forgiven of my sins, but I just keep messing up. I'm stuck. I'm stuck in sin. And I can't get out of it. I know I'm forgiven, but that, that's not life. It's because it's only half the gospel. Jesus is risen from the dead. He's alive, and he wants to give you power to live. And so the invitation is to come and die, and to lay your life afresh before Jesus and say, fill me, forgive me, use me. The resurrection is something that we live. It is something experienced. And I want to offer an invitation to you today. I'll ask the question, are you alive? Are you alive? And if not, then come to Jesus. Maybe you need to, some thinking needs to change in your heart and in your mind. If you've never recognized Jesus as risen again, as Lord and Savior, then the invitation is to come and grapple and come and bend the knee and say, I recognize that Jesus is King and Lord. And watch the transformation take place just as it was with Cleopas and his friend. Shall we pray?